Boom! I am live and on here. You gotta love it when a plan comes together. All right. Uh, in all actuality, this show was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. Uh, not without lack of trying, uh, however. I lost all internet. I lost all internet. Couldn't get online. Everything uh, kept giving me offline. No network. Um, and And eventually it worked. There you go. Long story short. Today's topic, <laughs> oh, mercy. Okay, so today we're talking about winter lifestyle for the Native Americans. Uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, today, common way of thinking, it gets cold outside, you come inside. What, you know, what can you do? Sorry about that. All right. Uh, it gets cold outside. You come inside, you kick up the heat, pray to the electric, don't go out. Uh, but how did the Native Americans do it? How did the Native Americans live uh, through really terrible winters without uh, all the modern conveniences that we use today? And that is the day's topic. Uh, we're going to focus on, uh, first of all, we're going to focus on spirituality. A myth that a lot of people tend to fall into when we talk about this topic is the uh, the myth that I'm sorry I shouldn't have came on. Okay, the myth that Native Americans were somehow just magical that they um, had a magic way about them, but the, the truth of the matter is they actually held a lot of respect for winter. Uh, they understood better than anyone else that uh, winter could bring a lot of bad things. You can freeze to death, starve to death. Uh, these were real threats, just like they would be for anyone else. And they were for them as well. Uh, maybe where the confusion comes in of uh, being more mystical is just the fact that their level of respect for the winter uh, was as much respect as you would show any other spirit being because they seen the winter itself as having a spirit. Uh, so they were very respectful to winter. Uh, and I think it's really important too, uh, when we talk about Native Americans in winter, is uh, the fact that they uh, weren't afraid to get accustomed to winter. So uh, it wasn't out of the ordinary and uh, Green Feathers is trying to join. I, I hope he just looks because I was late, so I wasn't sending out text. Uh, if there we go. The olden days, I and. In the starting cold, and you would see children. So they had races and games that they played in the snow a lot of times uh, with nothing more than wearing grease opposed to wearing clothes. And um, a, a lot of that comes uh, comes with them getting accustomed to the, the cold weather. The more you get yourself used to it, the more you can kind of handle it. Uh, and probably one of the other misconceptions was just the fact that it wasn't common to hear natives complain about the cold weather, but that falls back to the spiritual belief that I mentioned earlier. And um, it's it was just a fact of life. So complaining about it didn't make much sense. Let me uh, shout out to chat, chat room here real quick. Uh, creative redundancy, great to have you in here. OG Bushcraft, welcome, my friend. Mike in the cave, man, uh, great to have you here, bro. Uh, nature man, always good to see you, brother. Today we're talking about uh, winter survival and how the Native Americans did it. And uh, I did kind of cover the, the first part of the way they looked at winter and uh but but it is important to realize that just like everyone else they seen the dangers of winter as well so they just kind of held a respect for it um freezing to death were real threats starving to death were real threats uh, another thing i wanted to hit on in this before we got too awful far was cannibalism uh now it was uh, in the research I did, I, I find a lot about cannibalism. I got to say, from my personal perspective, my tribe, 
did not do use cannibalism as a way to survive. In fact, there was many stories and tales of why you would not do such a thing. And, uh, and you were considered, uh, they were considered monsters that ate human flesh. Um, but I don't speak for all native tribes and there may have been some that uh, partaked in human flesh. I can't verify that though. Um, again, uh, a lot of the things we learn about these ancient ways are uh, are from what people wrote down who a lot of times had an agenda to what they were writing. So you got to take it, you know, take it gently. You can't really just take everything word for word. And uh, and then I, I do follow up research with actual native council. So, uh, again, the cannibalism thing, not in my tribe, that much I can tell you. Uh summer and fall preparation yes definitely we're going to get into some of that now one of the other biggest things again i want to just blow away that little myth of cannibalism if, if it happened it sure didn't happen everywhere um the most common problems you would face in uh winter when it come to health was the elderly would have the most challenges and things like uh rheumatism and uh, lung infection were common before uh, incursion. They were, that was uh, two of the biggest fears of winter. Uh, a lot of body pains and possibly uh, not being able to breathe, falling into a pneumonia and dying. So um, another really important part to their winter was the winter forecast. And yeah, you know, we we go in, flip on the TV and we grab the, the local news from the morning weatherman. But they had a morning weather man, in, in a sense, uh, although he was all day long, I'm sure. Uh, there would be shaman whose specialty were um, predicting the weather. Now, this wasn't as magical as you might think. The, the Lenape especially were very, uh, very much nature people. They, they watched the animals uh, to learn what would happen in nature and there's a several little things that would indicate stuff to them like well for an example uh the muskrat hole if the muskrat holes are high up on the riverbank that's an indication that there's going to be a lot of snow and a lot of and a lot of water in the spring uh, if they're built way down low it's an indication that there won't be so much snow this winter which is good information to have. Uh, the same thing goes with hornet's nest. If you notice a hornet's nest and it's really, really high in a tree, that, partic that particular winter probably won't have a whole lot of snow. Uh, they also uh, watched and uh, noticed woodpeckers. Woodpeckers will, will a lot of times build extra large nests uh, when it's going to be a real cold winter. Take notice yourself sometime and see if any of these uh, proved to be true. Uh, another way of predicting weather was uh, the rings, the ring around the moon. I'm sure you've heard the ring around the moon, rain's coming soon, old wise tale. Uh, however, this, this was a method. And there's actually a little bit of science to that particular method. If you ever watch the ring on the moon and see that does precipitation does follow the ring uh, and the science behind that is is you're actually seeing the the vapor uh water vapor in the air in the atmosphere that's why it creates the ring and that's why rain generally follows or snow if it's in the winter time oh uh, yeah and, and recognizing the directions just like we do now we know like uh we get a big heavy uh, winds and snow clouds coming from the north, we know that that could indicate, you know, an extra heavy st snowstorm opposed to if it came from the east. Uh, however, there's always exceptions to these rules. I believe the uh, snowstorm the east coast is getting today is coming kind of from the south. So again, there's, there's, there's always an exception. But how right is our weatherman? And uh, I believe their weathermen were very well redeemed. So again, let me stop a second, holler out the chat room. Um, Green Eagle, if you're if you are out there, you know you got that link um, from zero to homestead. Welcome. Creative redundancy. Hey, hey, my brother Macy is in the house. Great to have you here, bro. Gemma is here. Uh Cliffside, welcome. Um uh, man, I, my print is so small. 
I know that uh, uh, preparedness. My what is it? J J T preparedness. I can't. My my eyes. I'm sorry, guys. I'm an old man. <laughs> uh, oh, gee, awesome. I got so many of you in here, and it's really great to see all you guys. Um, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue on with uh, with the information I'm sharing today. Uh, from weather prediction, I next put on my list um, the migration. Now, it's really important, again, to point out that not all tribes did things the exact same way. And in some cases, uh, tribes may have stayed in the, uh, in the winter, stayed uh, in their local area, and maybe bands of that tribe would go ahead and migrate. And in other cases, maybe the entire tribes would break off into bands and migrate. Uh, but there was definitely both styles of, of living that went on in, in this region. And um, the migration natives, the ones who would migrate, now they would migrate uh, in smaller bands. Now, one thing the natives um, will, will utilize is their people, uh, especially in the winter time. Now, although you, it does take more to feed your people in the winter time and to, you know keep your people make sure everyone's clothed and fed um there's also a lot of strength in the number especially when it comes time to huddling inside of homes the more people that are huddled together the warmer you'll be and that's that's one of the major tactics they would use to staying warm is uh utilizing body heat but now the smaller bands that would migrate they would break down to just smaller groups to what they could contain themselves for the winter they still had the small group for body heat uh, but they didn't have to worry about as much prepared food for the winter and the, to add to that the migrating tribes migrated with the animals and continued to hunt through the migration. Um, there was a writing of a guy who followed along one of the migrating tribes, and he noted that in a 38-day period, they hunted 330 deer and uh, dry, had, had cured dried meat, uh, but not intended to eat any of it. All the meat that they had uh, uh, procured for, from the hunts they were taking uh, that stuff was just getting packed. That was that was to be brought back in the spring when they came back to their villages up north, and it would it would be used for trade and and whatnot. So, or or village donation, depending. You know, there's a lot of different variables there. Will Yankee? Yes, definitely. What's going on, Will? Man, I'm sorry, bro. I can't even see your picture, dude. It's so itty bitty there on my phone and. Thank you, bro. I uh, appreciate you, man. So weather forecasting, migration, cool point with migration. Uh, don't underestimate any of the sexes, guys. The women were very, very valuable and important during migrating times. Uh, the women did most of the heavy work. The guys would be doing, like I said, you know, there's over 300 deer hunted in a, in a 38 or 20-day, 20, 20 38-day period. Um, the guys were obviously doing a lot of hunting and, uh, uh, and skinning and whatnot. The women were really the ones who were responsible for setting up the, the, the temporary camps. And temporary camps, now, like, I do have a picture of a uh, of a wigwam whoop up here behind me however uh, you know temporary camps could have took on just about any form more of a, a tp pole style um it would have been maybe um, maybe quicker to to assemble maybe in this case the poles would have been brought with uh so that they didn't have to be made on location or they would have been made on location but again this was the women who did the, a large majority of uh of that type of stuff. And I was going to throw up another picture back here for you guys. Um, if I can find it. Dun, 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 dun. Right here. Sorry about that. So like, um, let me turn this one up. That's good. Uh, just, you know, for an example of, of like here, here and here, uh, 
a type of shelter you would see maybe bushcrafters telling you, oh, a yeah, good emergency shelter or whatever. This could actually be a month long, a uh, couple week long, however long they stayed in that particular hunting area. And it would have been a simple shelter like that. Now, of course, as we get into uh, village life, we get into more of this type of uh, wigwam. Uh, this year is actually a longhouse. The picture is just smaller. It's just a, a wigwam that's like three times the size. Uh, but that's that's where we get into more of the village. Because, you know, a wigwam built in this construction, or like this one here, uh, this one up here, wigwams built in this construction, they were approximately a 10 to 15-year home. That's uh, that was about the intention of the lifestyle of the length of that type of uh, home. And you wouldn't necessarily live in it all that time either, because I'm going to get to that as we talk about village life here in a minute. Uh, the women did a lot. They didn't have horses here on the East Coast to to haul their loads. Uh, but don't underestimate that family dog, uh, because, of course, I think the dogs were a lot different when it comes to uh, their ability to live and stay outdoors uh, back then. The dogs today probably uh, wouldn't do as well of, uh, of, of handle and everything. Uh, look at there. I got Green Eagle in here. Hello, brother. Sorry about all that. I just, I stayed at trying to get the stream to go live. And when it went live, I was live, you know, so I was hoping you'd check it out. That's but, all. Uh, I'm glad I joined in time. I'm. I. I see the 25 minute mark, and my heart is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm this late. Yes. Yeah, no, so, you're uh, all right, bro. Uh, leaving you're, off you're where you left off. I want to do this. I want to do this because guys, uh, yeah. right now Green Eagle is. He's actually in the land of the Lenape. Uh, he is. Uh, he is in uh, part of New Jersey, and go like Green Eagle. Give everybody a quick tour there. Absolutely. So. Very briefly, the spot where I'm at here in central Jersey, uh, this is where my ancestors are from of native, you know, uh, descent. So the area where I live, I love uncovering areas that we don't know about, that people who live here and develop uh, plots and things like that in these areas of woods that are immaculate here um, are not sure about and have not found yet. So I happen to uncover a archaic in the sense of a few thousand years old uh encampment here which today i've relit a fire for you and i have actually recreated a uh way in which our ancestors who lived here would have cooked their meat which would have been prepared so this fire pit here which i show you has not been modified in any way since ancient times um I brushed all the leaves and debris off of here when I found this spot, but uh, the stone circle here, which I've got a fire going here, and uh, it's spit roasting some meat. It's raw well, red know, meat there. That area, you can see. Uh, green feathers. Let me, let me just tell you, say real quick, because we'll get back on topic here, but that area, you know, if that was to be um, uh, dug up properly, they, they, that may be found out to have been an actual wigwam you're standing in if the rock... rock That's correct. Is, is and old the old. approximate uh, region that I've uncovered here and cleared uh, in, in terms of just like the dirt that I've kicked off of the fire pit itself, likely the area would have been wider, would have extended outwards into the... These trees would not have been there in the past, no. but they would have been no. the same types of trees. These oak trees here, these white oaks, they're very bountiful. They're great for firewood, and um, they were used for multiple uh, of reasons. There's a lot of other trees in this woods here, which we'd be happy to go over with you some other time. But the approximate region, this could have been a hut that was used for various re uh, you know, reasons. A sweat lodge, for instance, in the winter months, or a seasonal lodge for smoking fish. Red ochre production would have been fired here. Many purposes for firing clay. Any, any reason that the people who lived here that used the research, re resources available here would have used fire, this fire pit has been unmodified and uh, relit for the first time, perhaps in a thousand plus years, completely untouched with the stone. 
uh, seat included. So, you know, this is a very ancient area here, this woods, and uh, there's burial mounds along the creek uh, about 100 yards down that way. But this is a very sacred spot for us. So thank you for joining us today. That is awesome. And, and thank you for taking us out there. Um, now, you know, we, we are talking, we're talking about winter survival, which, of course, you got a nice winter setting there today, too. That is incredibly awesome. Um, I did want to, I talked about uh, the migrating, and it's about where I'm into is the migrating. I'm about ready to get into village life. Um, and uh, again, I just wanted to mention that the migrators, they, they actually did a lot of hunting during the migration. So this is, was were, were really uh, the hardcore thing they did during the migrations. Uh, and uh, things they would hunt was deer, coon, muskrat, um, you know, several types of birds, grouse, uh, if, uh, or pheasant. Um, and, and again, like I mentioned, these, some of this may have been food that was used on the spot, but all the majority, all this hunting that would have been done, uh, they would have been curing this meat as they camped out for a few days here and there, uh, with the intentions to bring it back home in the spring for trade. Uh, the migration shelters, the women did a lot of the work or did all the work really on the base camp at home while the men were hunting. And uh, like I pointed out, these shelters wouldn't have been the elaborate wigwams. They would have been more temporary, more of a throw together quick shelter, uh, but definitely served the purpose. They would have still been big enough to have had a fire pit inside of it uh, because this would have been a, a very important part to staying warm in the winter. Uh, now let's go ahead and, and we'll get into village life a little bit and village life is in the village life. Of course, we're going to be using more of the bigger wigwams. Uh, so in some tribes, they would have used the longhouses just as a spiritual building. And in other tribes, they would have used the longhouses mainly in the winter time because of what I mentioned earlier, the more body heat, kind of the warmer it is. So if we pack everybody in the, in the building, uh, there's a lot of body heat in there. The, the large, um, the large longhouses, some of them were as big enough to have as many as three or four fire pits inside the longhouse so you know imagine you could you could fit a lot of uh tribal members inside there was a lot of room it wasn't out of the ordinary for for bed planks to have been built in a bunk bed style to give more room inside uh the the wigwams so that was another common thing you would have seen inside of them uh in the winter months they would use all those per, those predictions of weather I talked about earlier, and uh, they would decide where to relocate. So even the city, the, the, the town, the big village, whatever it is you choose to call it, in the winter months, they may have not have migrated with the small bands, but they still had a, a more secondary village for the winter months. So they would still evacuate that village if it was close to the right on the river banks and the muskrat hot, uh, holes are, are high up. Well, there's a good chance that that camp's going to be flooded in the spring and there's going to be a lot That's of snow. Correct. We're going to move up and they'll move up into the wooded area. Now, they always pick the wooded area for winter time, And the reason is because of your fuel. Why not? If you're going to burn wood for fuel, why not live? right next to the wood and uh so that was just a common sense thing one of the main practices of um of the time era too would have been to split and do firewood not early on but to wait until it was actually below freezing uh the the colder it gets you get down around zero and less firewood if you've ever split wood yourself with an axe the colder it gets, the easier wood splits. Well, the, they knew this too, and they didn't use the tools that we use today. So uh, it, they picked the easiest time to do the majority of their woodwork, of splitting for firewood and stuff. So they, they would split wood in the, in the wintertime, and the splitting of wood would help keep them warm as well, just from the action of doing it. Uh, 
staying warm. Of course, uh, in addition to firewood, which is where they would have moved the villages back uh, for the winter months near the firewood, they would also utilize um, other ways of staying warm, which would be their, their clothing, their furs, their body heat, uh, greasing your body. Um, I never tried it, but apparently that that helps uh, a bit as well, um, because they would grease themselves for uh, outdoor winter sports instead of wearing clothes at all. Um, but I, I don't I'm not ready to try it. How about you, Green Feathers? You ready to just grease up? and run? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm so ready to grease myself up and run around a place like this here in the freezing cold. But uh, I do think that. You know, insulating your pores in that sense probably does have a heating quality when you're in a warm place. So I completely understand where they were coming from. And some artifacts that I found indicate that they used fats for uh, lantern fuel as well. And that's kind of a new phenomenon that we've only learned within the last few years. So if you can right. see the um, fire I have going on back in my kind of Why don't fat, camp over there. Fats would be soaked, uh, cattails would be soaked in fats and then uh, used as torches. You, 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 would, you would pack and roll and tie that very tightly and, and continue to roll it in fat and then another layer tied tightly, roll it again in melted fat. And uh, the, that's what they would use as torches. They would burn for hours and they would burn bright. And so. the mindset that our ancestors had to use the materials that today people would not think to do that if we immediately have to go from a survival situation or from a situation in which we could purchase or, you know, obtain heat and light to a situation in which everyone had to go into a survival mode all of a sudden. Would you know instinctually to use those materials for those reasons? That takes trial and error over many hundreds of years. So our ancestors retain that knowledge passed it on, and fortunately uh, retained that information enough for us to pass on even to this day. So, Yeah, and you know, I think they retained it and passed it on enough for them to thrive for 10,000 years. So, I mean, you know, if you thrive for that long as a civilization, I think uh, you've, you're doing a pretty good job of teaching your Absolutely. youth. Absolutely. That's right. And they knew how to use the materials and the land. So, for instance, in the winter months here, uh, upon hunting either a, a, a primely stocked deer or a bear that was coming out of hibernation, which they would smoke out with fire, they would um, cure those fats in underground pits and wrap them in specific leaves and smoke them. And it would last the whole winter into the coming uh, early spring. So the corn from the summer, because of the long houses that we constructed here, would last into the early winter. And the meat that we hunted in the early fall into the winter would last us to the spring. So there was a continual and holistic and completely ecological and environmentally friendly uh, sense of continuing body, mind, and spirit. So the spiritual traditions which we continued from the Paleolithic, uh, you know, the Paleolithic Ice Age era, it's so cold out here, it's almost like the Ice Age in that sense. Uh, to today, Yankee and I are aware of some of those uh, traditions, but the traditions which our ancestors who lived and hunted here for many tens of thousands of years were revolved around the environment, time of year, uh, where the stars and sun were positioned in that time of year, and where the environment such as the snow and the cold allowed their mind body and spirit to be uh within right. the contemplative sense of self not only well, mentioned... physical at day to day but also in the mental reflective end of the day uh in the winter would be different than the end of the day in the summer right and i, I mentioned in the beginning of this video i mean it was it, it's a it's really important to know that they they had a um a spiritual connection and that they seen the winter as an entity that uh, as a, as a spirit itself uh, and, and showed it respect. So it's, you know, it's, it's in that concept that we look at winter differently anyway. Um, I think where people may say, well, yeah, that they natives, they ran around 
half dressed in the snow or, or not dressed at all in the snow. And uh, they, they don't, you know, they were like magic and they had no care for winter, but I think it was really ac actually the opposite. They knew that they could get their bodies custom to the winter by exposing it to it. Uh, so I think, you know, ever since you were a child, you play, if you played in the snow barefoot as a kid and you grew up doing this, it would be something that you just do. You know, I think that's a, you know, probably like a major point. In fact, to that, uh, no and magic involved. Just on, based on other holistic societies that lived on the concept of biosynthesis, one of my other ancestral groups would be the Ukrainians who uh, lived very holistically in that sense, where in their tradition, there were bathhouses and uh, sweat lodges similar to the natives here, where in the winter months, you would immerse yourself in intense uh, heat and then intense cold. So it would be a spiritual process reflected through your body sweating and shedding the uh, impurities, so to speak. And then coming out, it would, it would induce a state of um, reflection in a spiritual and, and physical sense, for sure. Correct. Correct. And I mean, there was there had been a whole ritual to the to that as well. And that was a cleanse. That was their cleansing process as well for not just spiritually, but even for body. So, you know, you would you would use different uh things that grow around you to to make you smell better even while you're doing this so that you you know it's kind of a um, a way of staying clean through the winter and to think that you know they were enjoying these luscious steam baths really is what they were uh you know uh, in the heart of the winter awesome hey in the woods with wolfie welcome off grid Bo. great to see you here my friend uh, today, we were just talking about winter survival in the Native Americans and, and some of the techniques they used to survive. And again, you know, um, preparation is something we talk about today as uh, uh, it being a special thing. Like, you know, uh, you, you this is your normal life and I'm a prepper, uh, you know, and it's a special preparing thing. They didn't look at it like that back then, you know, just like you, you have ancestors in your own bloodline, whether or not there's no native at all, who, who at one point in history just looked at preparing as normal life. Uh, and that's probably a major factor of what got them through the winter is the fact that they knew what to expect. They knew uh, what dangers there were and they knew they couldn't stop it. So you just, got yourself ready for it you know that's what you did through the summer months if the, and uh and you got prepared in fact though a lot of native americans look forward to winter like i mentioned the village life uh in village life a lot of times uh it was like things shut down for the for the winter so you would all just kind of huddle together and you would share stories or you would plan um future builds or future raids or whatever it is you're doing uh you may go out on hunts because of course just like a hunter today will tell you tracking game is a lot easier and and fresh fallen snow so they definitely would have taken advantage of that opportunity as well but uh it was also a time for resting sleeping late um and telling stories and educating. And uh, so there was a lot of a lot of looking forward to this time of year, if you were all properly prepared. I'm not sure what's been up, CL. That's right. And aside from storytelling, there was the reflection upon uh, the family and everyone around you in the immediate moment. And yeah. one... Um, culture in modern day, which is very immersed in kind of the winter time. Uh, the concept is kind of referred to as an inner heat and as a uh, family love kind of heat is in Finnic and Scandinavian culture, um, tying back to the concept of warmth and of the energy that keeps you going through the season. They have a whole system of inner heat and of uh that concept of wholesomeness would be the closest word that we could use in english but i think the natives had more definitive terms that were reflected in their extremely 
intimate lifestyles. Family community was really important. I think one of the things we don't uh, do today that was common then was uh, we don't rely on one another. And uh, it, it wasn't about you and your achievements it was about what you could do for the community and those achievements together and uh you know like when it comes to hunting we talked about this with so many people that uh, a lot of times native americans were looked upon by europeaners as lazy and the reason they were looked on as lazy was because they wouldn't work a full work day like a european would you know, European had the Christian religion who pretty much uh, preached that if you weren't working, you better be praying. And if you ain't working and praying, you're sitting. And uh, the Native Americans, well, they didn't look at it that way. How they would work is they would assess what was needed and every person there would come together and acquire the goal until they had what they needed. And then the work was done. Uh, and when the work's done, then you can chill out, relax. That's correct. Right around. So, it's, you know, it's, and it's not, not a sense of being lazy. It was actually the Europeaners couldn't understand what it meant for every man, woman, and child to gather together for the same thing. Today, we're going to fish. Well, I didn't go fishing if today we're going to fish. If today we're going to fish, the whole village comes with. When we go fishing. Correct. And, and I and would say in weird. regards to we the all mindset that certain uh, European groups carried over with them was either reflective of the level of material comfort they had in their country versus the level of uh, survival skills necessary. So uh, as I mentioned before, some of my family who came here from places like the mountains of Ukraine, um, they had that mindset of family of uh, needing to hunt another culture that was resonant with the natives when they came here were the Scots. In fact, the British called them the cousins of the, uh, of the natives because they followed a matrilineal system of marriage and kinship. Uh, yep. In ancient times, they painted themselves and they recognized that the natives lived in a way which was similar to their ancestors so there was that corruption from the sort of imperial and materialistic mindset from many uh quote-unquote europeans who came here um but in that sense any individual who goes anywhere with the mindset of thinking that you can overtake the land the people the material uh it's reflective of yourself it's reflective of damage within yourself. So uh, the, the, you know, the natives, there was a lot of damage in that part of the world when some groups came here, which is why yeah. they came here. So in that sense, uh, you know, there was a lot of resources materially and spiritually wisdom. And then also the totality of the beautiful woods we have here. And everything else that went along with that, which allowed for our, uh, the United States to become the country well, that it is today. I would say, and, and we're, we're coming to a closing here on this video, but I would say my, my take on um, how did Native Americans survive the winter, and my answer in a, in a simple form would be they could survive the winter because they did it, because they were out there in it. They knew what they had to do to survive it. And it was a tested theory, not just a thought, not just a YouTube video. It was a tested theory. So could you survive like a Native American? I would say to you, go out and try. Uh, experiment. See how far you can go with your survival skills. Uh, you know, surviving is is just being ready to, to face what you're facing. Uh, you know, you can be a survivalist and have all the things you love and enjoy because you just prepare for them. Um, 
but you'll never know if you could really do it unless you you really try to do it and um and that's i think that's what you're left with i i believe when it came down if it came down to it a lot of people a lot more people could do it than they realize and there's probably I agree. a bunch of i completely that, you agree know, yeah. So, you know, survival is funny. It's a funny thing because there's a thing in your brain that kicks on and you want to survive even when you're faced with nothing. So, um, you know, in community, that's probably the other biggest reason I would say the advantage Native Americans had over us uh, was the fact that it was community. Uh, they didn't have you didn't have to ever worry about your one individual needs because the whole entire group worried about everyone equally. Uh, and I think that's a concept that's really hard for us to even imagine because it's, it's so different than the lifestyles we all have today uh, where we just provide for us and our family and uh, not to realize what it is like to just provide for every single person in town. We all do that together. You know, it's, it's, a, it's different. It's different. It's a different. It's a completely different way of life going uh, even into making your own tools, making your own way of being from day to day. How many people can wake up and say, Hey, I got my own food and I made my own house today. Probably about five people in the world day to day in today's day and age can say that. So in that sense, we should all look back to this, you know, uh, mindset of our ancestors from the native cultures who, you know, we're here through trial and error and we're here because they survived and they're still here. Yankee and I are here. There's many other descendants of natives and there's uh, many resources that you can access to learn so much about the people who have been here and are here. Awesome. And uh, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. But I'm going to leave you with a, a, a closing thought and uh, I'll pose it as, as a question and uh, you go ahead and uh, answer it in the comment section down below. And uh, don't forget to say hello to Green Feathers. And if I don't have his link in the description, it will be. Give me a give me time to get it in there, and I will get it in there. Um, but but I'd just like to think about this for a moment. Is if if we were ever denied gas, electricity, uh, and, and we just, it just wasn't here for us anymore, with all the technology and miracle fibers and installations that we have. Do you think uh, we would live as warm as our natives did with the installations and uh, uh, type of material covers and fibers they had? Which do you think would have would serve better if there was no possible chance of having the electric gas uh, uh, or anything of the sort. And uh, I am curious what you have to say about that. So definitely leave me a comment in the comment section down below. A big shout out to Creative Redundancy, Mike the Caveman, In the Woods with Woofy, uh, Off Grid Bo. Uh, so many awesome guys come in here. Will was in here. Diana was in here. Uh, did I miss anybody else? I know, I know I said hello to a bunch of people earlier. I may see, um, so many cool people. Great to have you all here. Green feathers. Thank you, my friend. It was awesome to have you here. And, uh, again, guys, don't be afraid to leave a comment. Let me know, uh, your answer to my question. And if you have any questions for me or green feather, just put them in the comment section down there. Well, we both see them and uh, he's got the ability to answer them just as easy as I do. So uh, right. until our trio meet again, I hope all your adventures are awesome. Oh, thank you. Cliffside. I do appreciate you, my friend. And um, Dwayne, welcome and goodbye uh y'all have a great day thank you again green feather just hang thank on you. the line up. thank you wanishi my friend thank you and wanishita to you as well and wanishita to all of you thank you all